Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm here with Coco. We're going to continue in our study in the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And uh, I wanted to reintroduce Coco. Some of you haven't seen him in a while. I was asked if I would uh, let Coco come into the picture here for a short while. We're going to uh, continue on in our study in chapter 2, looking at the letter to the church at Pergamos. And uh, so we're going to try to take somewhat of a bird's eye view of this letter. You're such a good boy. Give me kisses. You're so sweet. You are. You're so sweet. Now, I'd like to uh, begin this video by asking you all for your, uh, your prayers concerning an injury that I sustained uh, two days ago when I uh, kind of got in over my head uh, in a run-in with a steer. And uh, it was a minor neck injury that uh, has caused me great discomfort, headaches, migraines, and... Uh, uh, some pull tendons in my neck and shoulder and so if uh, you would pray for me for comfort and healing I would appreciate it now before I begin here with uh, our study continue on in our study with the third letter to the church at Pergamos I'd like to do something a little uh, sort of out of the ordinary and that is uh, I'd like to begin by discussing something with you concerning what our Lord said to his disciples in John chapter 14. I don't usually do this sort of thing, but uh, I think it, it might even be appropriate, more appropriate, if I actually did a scripture reading before each video, but that turns out to be a little too time consuming and it takes away from the time that I'm able to actually spend in the text that we're looking at. Now, folks, listen to me very carefully. I do not like slaughtering sacred cows or traditions. But there's, in my opinion, and I'm not asking anyone to agree with me, there's been a, uh, a misconception uh, on the part of most Christians concerning the meaning of John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and whither I go you know, the way, the way that I know, I go, you know, he says, the, this, you know the way. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, I hardly know where to begin here, but let me just start out by saying, that I do not believe, and I, you know, I sincerely hope that you don't just take and click off of this video right from the outset without giving me the opportunity to explain. I do not believe that this is talking about heaven. First of all, let's take it very carefully step by step. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also into me, says the Greek. There is a great emphasis in Paul's epistles on our position in Christ. In my Father's house. Now, right away, we want to just naturally take the assumption that what he's referring to is heaven. 
when he refers to my father's house. We want to read into the text, automatically just assume that he's referring to heaven. And I don't believe that he is. In fact, if you go down through the entire passage of John 14 and, and take a serious look at all of the dialogue and the context in which he's speaking, heaven is nowhere in view. Now that may shock some of you, but that's just simply the truth of the matter. What is my father's house? I'm going to suggest to you that the phrase in my father's house is referring to himself because the father dwells in him. In me, in my father's house, are many mansions and then now we can launch off into a sermon about how wonderful it's going to be to have that mansion on a, on a hilltop. Of course, we know that the translators inserted the word mansions in the, in the King James. And once again, I, it is not my intention to take and rob you of some blessed comfort or blessed hope in, in the fact that, that, you know, in pointing out that I don't believe this is talking about heaven. But there are other passages that do talk about heaven. And what I'm suggesting is, is that there's nothing wrong with having a hope of, 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 of going to heaven. But we don't find it here. We find something much more important for the, for the present time. Uh, the, the focus is on the present, not the future, at least from our standpoint. From the disciples' standpoint, the focus was on something future, but it wasn't heaven. He says that in, my, in me, in my Father's house, are many dwelling places. The word is meno in the Greek. It is unmistakably a, a word that simply means abiding place. In me are many abiding places. Now, without jumping ahead to John 15, John chapter 15, where we know that, that He's the vine, we're the branches, and we're to abide in Him and, and He in us, which perfectly fits the context of what we're looking at in John 14. Without really jumping ahead there, if you want to do that later, I, I highly suggest you do that. But that is the, the context, that's the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey to us in this message of John 14 where that Jesus is speaking to his disciples concerning the fact that there is, uh, there is a position for the believer in Christ in which he is to remain or abide. In my Father's house that is in me are many abiding places. Many. And I, believe, I take that to refer to all of God's children, all of, the, of God's elect. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And now, once again, our mind immediately jumps to the hereafter. Well, when did he go to prepare that place of our abiding in him? Well, it's obvious from the context. It's obvious from the chapters ahead. It's obvious where he went to prepare that place, and that was Calvary, the cross. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now see, Steve, he's talking about the rapture or the second coming. or well, I don't believe he is. If I go and prepare a place for you, that is through Calvary, a place where that you can abide in me, in my Father's house in which he dwells in me, I will come again. Well, when did he come again? We, we tend to, to skip over the fact that He came again at Pentecost in which the Holy Spirit would dwell in them and they would have that abiding place. I will come again and receive you unto Myself that where I am, there you may be also. That is, in Him. In the Father's house. I may... And I know, folks, I can just, I can hear some of you out there now saying, but Steve, now wait a minute. Now, you're really stretching the text. You're really pushing the text. 
Folks, I don't believe I am. And, and just for the record, I'm not alone in this interpretation of this passage. There are others who, who understand this is the same as I do. He did receive them unto himself when he came again. And he says, and where I am, there ye may be also. We are together, we abide together in that place. I and you, you and me. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. So they know the way. Jesus is telling his disciples that they know that way. Now, if you take that as heaven, it doesn't make, to me, it doesn't make any sense at all. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. Thomas didn't understand what he was talking about. I'm sure that Thomas perhaps under, looked at, at, at the words that Jesus, took the words that Jesus was saying as perhaps the way that we often do. And which is that he was referring to something future, something out of the, out of the, the measure of time and space. How can we know the way, he says? And what's remarkable about this is that Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I'm sure that many could argue, and many have, that in, in, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, Steve, that's, I don't have any problem with that. He's still talking about heaven. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no, no man can come unto him, okay, unto the Father, but through Christ. And if we do, we'll, we'll go to heaven. So he's referring to heaven. Now, why do I, why am I going through all this? It's, it, it was really not my desire to put this insert, this section of John 14 into our study in Revelation chapter 2, the, church, the letter to the church at Pergamos. Let me just say once again that it is not uncommon for Revelation, as well as other parts of Scripture, to use language that is figurative and symbolic. You'd have to look at, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it wouldn't be uh, all that uncommon. It's not all that uncommon. It shouldn't be all that uncommon for us to look at, at, at the way Jesus is speaking. He's speaking of something that is, uh, it's an idiom, it, it, uh, for lack of a better expression. In my Father's house, that is in me, are many abiding places. Our relationship, Jesus' concern was not in, in letting them know that they were going to be with Him in heaven, that they'd have a mansion on a hilltop. That is not His concern in this passage of Scripture. He's, he's about ready to go to the cross, and His main concern is their walk, relationship with Him post-Calvary. That they were to abide in Him. That they would have a place in Him. That they would have a... Uh, a measurable uh, context of, of relationship with Him in which He was the vine, they were the branches, and that by abiding in Him, they would bear much fruit. We see that as we continue on uh, through John 14 into chapter 15, even into chapter 16. And they knew the way. They knew the way because, because they, Jesus had instructed them on the fact that he had to die in order that they might have life. It is a relationship passage that has to do with their ongoing walk in relationship with Christ in their lives, their present lives. That was his concern. Uh, now, if you want to argue, and, and it's fine if you do, if, and if you want to hold, if you want to look at this and you want to take that as, as a comforting passage, a, a message of, of life in the hereafter, uh, feel free to do it. I'm not going to criticize you. Many do. But it, is not, it has never been my position. 
or at least for the past 30 years or more. It's never been my position that that's what he's talking about. And you see that really, it, it comes out forcefully, very strongly in both the language and the grammar. One of the most important things that a Christian can concentrate on, focus on, talk to others about, be a witness about, is the fact that we, in Christ, we are to abide, remain in Him when, as it pertains to fruit bearing. That we have no strength in and of ourselves, that everything flows through the Father, through Christ, through us. It is Christ in us, the hope, our hope of glory. It, it, is, it is one in which our life, our, our ministry, our message, our, our purpose is all wrapped up in the fact that we are in Christ, in Christ. It's a term that you, nowadays especially, that many Christians seldom uh, hear spoken of. And so, as I said, I, I didn't, I don't want, it's not my intention to try to, you know, uh, slaughter these sacred cows, but I felt like that that was a, a good place to use as an example of figurative language. Uh, and so we're going to go off uh, into a passage that I believe does the same thing here in uh, of course, I believe all the letters, to some extent, uses figurative language. And there's nothing wrong with, with looking at, at, at the... I think it's important to take note of the fact that we sometimes... In our, what we will see in our study through these letters is sometimes the Lord will take and interpret the, the, the figurative language that He used, uh, such as the angels being... He uh, referred to the stars being referred to as the angels, the messengers of the churches, the, the churches themselves being referred to as golden candlesticks. Revelation 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand in the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. He explains it. Scripture, we have Scripture interpreting Scripture. But sometimes we don't have that luxury. And uh, as I pointed out in my I believe I pointed out in my previous video, there's literal language, there's figurative language, there's uh, what I believe is literal figurative language. Uh, it, the letter to Pergamum begins with the phrase, sharp sword with two edges, okay? Uh, I, I'm trying to explain to you that I somewhat, in a, in a, to a certain extent, if not to a full extent, what I do what I see in that phrase, that sharp sword with two edges, which I know is the Word of God, okay, from Hebrews, I know that that's, he's referring to the Word of God. He could have said just Word of God, but he, he says sharp sword with two edges. Well, back to John 14, in my Father's house. Well, he could have said, in me are many abiding places, but he says, in my Father's house. Are, are, you, are you following what I'm, I'm saying here? Now, I think it's important to bear in mind that he begins with referring to sharp sword with two edges, but we have to remember all of the fear nots. Okay? Now, we'll go on later in the text, and that'll be confirmed. Okay? Okay. Uh, which is extremely important because it's easy to go into this and, and uh, many unlearned Christians will read those words, uh, sharp sword with two edges, oh my God, you know, God is, you know, there's, there's, there's a possibility for uh, judgment for the believer in Christ. And our text won't allow us to say that. I know thy works and where thou, thou dwellest, okay, 
even where Satan's seat is. But he will go on to say, and uh, once again, I want to have to refer back to the text. If I go back to what we read here, that, and bear with me for a moment, I'm, I'm working here without, I'm actually winging it without an outline. I don't even have an outline for this video. I'm just strictly looking at my Bible on the screen here. It is not the sharp sword with the two edges that he refers to in verse 12, which is where we're picking up in this video here. Uh, verse 16, if we jump ahead, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We see the same phrase, sword, used there. So we know that's the sword of his mouth. That's the Word of God. So now back to verse 12. We know the sharp sword with the two edges is the Word of God. But what's interesting here is, is that in looking at verse 16, repent or else I'll come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with a the sword of my mouth. He says, most directly, he says that, I mean, take a look, folks, at who he's going to fight against. I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth? No. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's what I wanted to point out there concerning that. So I know thy works, he says, and where thou dwellest. And now we have a most interesting word. The word there, dwellest, listen to me, folks. The word means to have settled in permanently. That's the word. It's a compound word. It's from, in the Greek, it's from two words. It's from kata, meaning down, or uh, according to. And it, that prefix there, kata, it, it intensifies the, the word uh, oikeo, which means to dwell or reside. It's not the word that we read, that we read back in John 14, in my father's house are many abiding places that word there abide is meno in the greek this is not meno this is oikeo okay kata oikeo so it the prefix intensifies oikeo the word properly means to settle down as a permanent resident so that is in a fixed permanent dwelling place as, 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 as someone's own personal residence, okay? Now, so figuratively, what it means is it means to be exactly at home. I am at home, okay? Now, in the context of this church here at Pergamos, you know, we're looking at where the, the throne of Satan is. And I'm going to suggest, and I'll just go ahead and put, throw this out, I really wasn't prepared to say it yet, but I'm taking the throne of Satan as more than just Pergamos. Satan is the god of this world. Okay? He's not just the god of Pergamos. It's not, uh, Pergamos was not just some place where Satan dwelled or Satan had his throne. Satan is the god of this world. And so, when I go through this, I have to, I have to take careful note of these facts and cross-reference. So they've settled down in a fixed, permanent dwelling place. And this in Pergamos was one of, one of the, the most places of uh, the greatest of greatest idolatry, the most false worshiping gods and temples of just about any place on earth. Okay? And they have settled down and, and made permanent their residence there. Okay? They were exactly at home. He's speaking to the angel, okay, the messenger of the church at Pergamos. And he's saying, you've settled down. You've made this place your home. The force of, of the prefix kata suggests down to the finest exact detail, you have made this place your permanent residence, okay? Now you can argue, 
and I'm sure some would, that, well, Steve, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, perhaps the same thing is, is, was true of the, of the Ephesians, okay? Perhaps the same thing is, is, was true of the, of the church at Laodicea, that they had settled down there and made that, that what that's basically referring to is it's just referring to simply something uh, physical in nature, that they, they've settled down as a permanent residence, uh, resident, w wherever they're at, that's where they've settled down, and that's all that means. And folks, I don't believe that for one second. I believe that what the Holy Spirit is telling this angel, this messenger of the church at Pergamos, is, is that you have settled in and made permanently, okay, my stomach's growling here. I must have not had enough coffee this morning. Your residence here, you, you just make, you're making yourself at home within this place in which Satan dwells, the world. You made the world your home, okay? Well, let's go ahead and say that. That's what I believe the text to be saying. Even where Satan's seat is, okay? But despite that, and now, and now we're going to be looking at some marvelous grace here, okay? This is what amazes me about these letters. Okay, you, you have commendation, you have some criticism, but the grace that's displayed by the Lord through the Holy Spirit and through John to us, to them and to us, here is pure, unadulterated, amazing grace. You, you don't want to miss that, folks. Because despite the fact that they had settled in and made this world their home, what does he say? Thou holdest fast my name. You hast not denied my faith. And, I, and, and most of you know that I'm, I look at that genitive there as his faithfulness. That has not denied my faith. He didn't say, hast not denied your faith. He said, hast not denied my faithfulness. His faithfulness. It's a genitive. And now we're looking at the word antipas. And folks, I've, I've tried to explain that I'm not interested in giving a history lesson on the area of Pergamos or the, the lives of these individuals or anything else. It's what I want you to see is the doctrine that leads to godliness that we see in these passages of Scripture. That, folks is more important than anything else. Antipas. Well, I find that interesting. Anti, everybody knows kind of know what knows that the word that that means against, anti, against. But what's interesting is pos is the Greek word that means all. Antipas's name literally means against all. That's what it means. Now, I don't know how you would look at that, but the way I would look at that is, is that given the context, given the present location, okay, in which, uh, we're in which the place in which Antipas was slain, it doesn't surprise me that he was up against just about everything. He was God's faithful martyr. The word is witness. He was God's faithful witness. And he was slain among those there at Pergamos, the believers at Pergamos. They had a firsthand experience of his testimony of faith, not, not as much his faith, but a witness of him being a witness to the faithfulness of God. That's what I want you to see who was slain among you. And folks, I pointed out, we were sent among, as sheep among wolves. And this is where Satan dwelleth. If we limit that to where, it, it, to me it's ludicrous to suggest, well, okay, Pergamos is where Satan dwelled, and he certainly doesn't dwell in Monroe, Oklahoma. Or he doesn't, he doesn't dwell in Washington, D.C. 
You know, he doesn't dwell in America. He doesn't dwell in Canada. He doesn't dwell in Australia. He 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 doesn't even dwell in Israel. He he dwells. He dwelt in Pergamos, and I guess maybe now Pergamos. He's still there. Either he's still there, or Satan's relocated somewhere else. So he Satan moves around a lot, and he's. I mean, really, come on. I don't believe that that's what the text is teaching us here. Where Satan dwelleth. He's the God of this age. So, the, right away we see the Lord, I believe, pointing out the fact that they have settled in permanently to that address. That, that they are they are content being of, of to be living in the world and yet despite that fact they haven't denied his name and they haven't denied his faithfulness that's what i'm seeing in the, in the text and now he launches off into the i have a few things against thee that is the and that's the singular that's the messenger of the church that thou hast there okay certain ones that uh, uh, we find it difficult to read about. Now stop and think, folks. I have a few things against the singular that thou hast there. Okay? Not that he has a few things against those that he has there. Okay? But I have a few things against thee, the messenger of the church, the angel of the church, whether it's pastor, elder, deacon, board of directors, however you want to take that. And I, I've, in the past several videos I've covered, I've basically put forth my position on what I believe the angel means here. That is, it is not a, a holy angel. Holy angels, uh, I don't believe, uh, depart from a faith. Holy angels don't need to repent. Uh, holy angels... He's not writing and, and criticizing holy angels. And it certainly wouldn't be unfallen angels. It's There are human messengers. The word agelion means messenger. It's all the word means. The translators made it say angel. And, and he has a few things against the messenger of this church or the message of this church. Apparently the message or the mess of this church wasn't everything that God wanted it to be. And as a result, there were there those that held the doctrine of Balaam, held to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught uh, uh, Balak, Balak to cast a stumbling block before God's people Israel, uh, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, to commit fornication. And, and, uh, and he says, you also, that's not all, but you also have them that hold to the doctrine of the, the Nicolaitans. Okay, so... Uh, keep in mind the church at Ephesus you know they, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans as Jesus did but here we're looking at those who actually held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing uh, he also hated and uh, without going into great detail concerning all this uh, my best uh, efforts in, in looking at this the, 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 the time that I've I've, I've devoted to looking at trying to get understand the meaning of all of this, the criticism that the Lord has. Uh, what I'm seeing is in, in a sort of in a nutshell here is that it, what it encompasses without going into a lot of historical detail, what it encompasses is are the two extremes within Christianity. And these are the two extremes that we want to avoid. One is, on the one hand, is uh, legalism, okay? And the other, licentiousness. Those are the two extremes. And, and I do believe, I'm a firm believer in the fact that we as believers want to avoid both extremes. And he says, repent or I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. Now, I spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about this. So, is what he's saying, well, if you repent, 
I won't come again quickly. Okay. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. So I want you to repent. If you don't repent, I'm going to come unto you quickly. Well, what? So it, if they do repent, he's not coming unto, the, unto them quickly. I guess, you know, you could take it that way. And folks, I don't believe that's what it's saying. I believe that the grammar of the text or the construction of the words, the sentence in the text literally states that he's asking them to change their mind. Again, he's speaking to the angel now of the messenger here. I want you to repent, change your mind, or I will come. Or, or, but whether you do or whether you don't repent, I'm going to come unto thee quickly. Okay? The language, the grammar bears that out. He's going to come again quickly. And the word quickly does, is, the word there is that, that word that we use where we get our word tachometer, you know, uh, tach, tachis in the Greek. It's, it's an appointed time. I am going to come at an appointed time whether you, I want you to repent Okay, but whether you do or you don't, I am I'm coming at an appointed time and I will fight against you. No, I'll fight against them. Okay, so whether you do or not, whether you repent or not, I'm, I'm coming quickly. Okay, why would you want to uh, be involved in that? I want you to repent from, of it. Why? So why would you be involved in that? That it, uh, of which I am coming to judge by the sword of my mouth, my this double-edged sword that denotes judgment, and I believe severe judgment. Why would you want to be involved in that when when I'm coming to to be to to judge them? Okay. Why would you want to? You're not, it's there is no condemnation, folks, for the believer in Christ. There's no condemnation to this messenger that he's writing to. There's no condemnation to the believers there at Pergamos. But he's coming at an appointed time, and he's asking the messenger to change his mind. Okay, as far as the message, his, his message is concerned. His message was not right, and if he doesn't change his mind. That means that uh, uh, he's going to come at its God's appointed time. No, God is going to Jesus is going to return at the, his appointed time, whether they repented or they didn't, folks. Okay, and he'll he will wage war with them. Okay, with the sword of his mouth, my word will war against them. Yours ought to be doing that now. It's, I, I hate reading in between the lines, but to me that's basically what I'm saying. That Jesus is saying to this angel, this messenger of the church, that you know your word, which is only to be my word, is, is really not waging war against them. Okay? Like it should. That the word of God is, is that the is that sword and and so his word will war against them if it's going to whether his the messengers does or not and he who hath an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches plural now now again once again just just as in we have in the first two letters uh there's a message to the believers not just the messenger of the church, the angel of the church, but those, all of those who have an ear to hear and who has an ear to hear, I've said this over and over again, only God's people can hear. My sheep hear my voice. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, plural, that's all the churches, okay? These letters were shared. There's application for every believer in every church in all seven letters. And that shouldn't be that shouldn't take any of us by surprise. And to him that overcometh, well, and I spent some time thinking about this. Even though I've, I'm absolutely dead certain of the fact that that we've 
we don't overcome in our own strength. We don't overcome the flesh. We don't overcome uh, Satan on our own. We don't, it's not, it hasn't been left up to us that, well, maybe there's those Christians out there that overcome and then there's, there's those Christians that don't overcome and, and God's just hoping that most of his, his, his children overcome and, and if they do, there's a reward. They'll go to heaven. There'll be a reward. If they don't, overcome well then now there's there there's facing dire consequences and and of course we know that that's not theology that's garbology all right to him that overcometh well who overcame he's talking to those who to him that overcometh we are overcomers his people are overcomers and when do we overcome at the end of this life when the Lord's returns? Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, do we overcome at some point in time during the tribulation when we're before the throne of God and we've been judged for our works? And so, uh, you know, we have there's on the scales there's more good been more good than bad, and so now we it, it can we we can say that that we've overcome. When did we overcome? And I'm going to suggest that we overcame when Christ died in our place. Okay, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And now we get into uh, some real dynamics here. The hidden manna. Now, folks, I'm going to take this uh, in the most simple way as I can. Uh, sometimes I do think we tend to muddy the waters and we t do th tend to make things more complicated. We, uh, we should know what manna represents, okay? What was manna? In the, in the wilderness, the children of Israel received manna. It, we, it came from God. It came from heaven. Uh, it sustained them through their journey through the wilderness. It was God's provision, perfect provision. They might have complained about it. They got tired of eating it all the time. Okay, all right. You could, you could. I can see how we could easily associate manna with the Word of God. Christians tend to, you know, think Bible study is a is a chore, and sometimes even a bore. We get, you know, for lack of a better expression, we get tired of it. Uh, I don't. I know many of you don't, but. There are Christians out there that that's they they tend to look at it as the same old manna, okay, you know, and maybe you could even go as far as to say, well, you know, we've heard this so many times, it's just the same regurgitated truth over and over, and it gets to be such a common truth that it, it sort of loses its shine, it loses its value. Uh, I'm I'm not I've never been one to take that position, but but we folks are are presently, symbolically, uh, figuratively, we are going through our desert, our journey, our, our present wilderness journey in which God is providing for our every need. But it, the text says that it's hidden. All right? Now, I'm going to suggest that I, that I believe that that is hidden in the sense that each one of our needs are uniquely different. Mine may, may not be the same as yours and vice versa. And, and we are certainly not privy to the knowledge or privy to, to, to what those uh, provisions really ever are. I mean, we can guess, you know, we can kind of second guess God, but I'm looking at this not as uh, something future. I'm looking at it uh, as something present. I will in the future tense, he says, give. But what has perfect tense, okay? You see the perfect tense there. What The perfect tense, folks, says that what was hidden in past time with the consummate result that it is that it presently remains hidden, okay? That's what the perfect tense says. Okay? Any of you Greek students out there know what the how to look at the perfect tense. 
The perfect tense says that some action occurred in past time with the consummate results that it continues on in the, in the present time. That's the perfect tense. So what was hidden in past time? It was hidden with, with the result that it, it presently remains hidden. Okay, We don't know. We do not know what God's provision for us is from day to day. Okay, and, and more particularly when it comes to the Word of God. We are being, we know that as believers in Christ, that we are being taught by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Listen to me carefully, folks. God does not just throw spiritual truth out there and just say, okay, I, I hope y'all latch on to this. And, and it's, it's kind of up to you to do that. You know, I've led you this far. But it's, now you're on your own. And did not Jesus say that he would like to say more, but they couldn't to his disciples, but they could not bear it now? Okay? Listen, folks, listen. What the Lord may intend to reveal to, to you, he may not, he may feel that the Holy Spirit may feel that some this other believer, whoever he is, brother or sister out here, may not be able to bear that now. Okay? We're looking at something very dynamic here. It's the work of God in our lives. And the work of, our, of God in our lives is very precise. Okay? It, it isn't... I'm trying to think of the opposite word for precise. You know, it's... What may be true... Uh, in my case, needful in my, what may be a provision in my case may not be a provision in your case. Okay. So it's hidden. Now that's how I'm looking at that. And, and we have, we have the word and, which is a connecting conjunction, which takes us into the white stone, the white stone with a new name written on it. And again, I, and, uh, and I'll say it again, I hate slaughtering sacred cows. I hate taking away people's uh, interest or hope or, or, or you know, excitement about, any, about things that are future, folks. This is blessed hope forever, okay? This ministry. There's a lot of focus on the hereafter. it has been a lot of focus on what awaits us, the excitement uh, of the things that are to come, all those things that are to come. But... He's writing to seven churches. As I pointed out, I believe the application is, is, is not just strictly to the church, the condition of the church prior to the Lord's return, but it has to do with the literal churches that existed uh, all the way from Pentecost all the way to the day of the Lord. Okay? There's application here. And I believe God has much more to say to us than... Well, okay, you're one of my children now, and you're just, and you can look forward to heaven when you die, and forget everything in between. All right, don't worry, don't worry about doctrine. Don't worry about all that complicated doctrine and stuff. You know, don't worry about all the details, the specific. Don't worry about you know all that stuff in between earth and heaven, okay? Or or your new birth in heaven. Don't worry about all that. That that'll all work out. Just focus on heaven when you die. You're a Christian now. You're one of mine. I've let you know that you belong to me and you're going to heaven. I assure you, you're going to be with me in heaven. And that's all you got to worry about. Instead of taking at least the honest, an honest look at this text and, and, and at least considering that just quite possibly the hidden manna and the white stone has to do with something here and now. Okay? And, and, and to take that thought seriously, especially when the grammar tends to, to point to lead us to that conclusion. The white stone. When did we overcome? Not in heaven. We overcame, or we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we don't overcome in, uh, halfway between here and heaven. We don't overcome in our own strength. We don't overcome here. But we overcame when Christ died in our place. We are now overcomers, okay? now okay and he says we'll give him future tense that's a future tense a white stone and you could say okay the future tense steve 
That's heaven. And I'm not so sure. Just because that, that's a, that is a future tense does not necessarily mean that we don't now possess that white stone. Oh, but Steve, I don't have a white stone. Where's, you know, show me your white stone. And, you know, I, and it's and it's better have a new name written on it. And and if you're saying I have a white stone, well, uh, then that's a mystery to me. And because I, I certainly don't, I've never seen that, and I've never seen a white stone with my new name written on it. Let's hold on a minute, okay? And again, I don't ask anybody to agree with me, but let's look at this, okay? We know white. Uh, was the the, uh, uh, the it was in the it was the custom of the Jews to, to and when they casted a vote okay uh, a vote a, a white stone was was a, a vote for yes a, a dark stone black stone was a vote for no or one was a positive the other was a negative okay uh, the, the actually the 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 word there denotes vote it's the word vote so the first time you, the first occurrence is when we see Paul and talking about him, him casting his vote in the persecution of Christians. Okay, he put in his two cents worth. He cast his vote. Okay, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except he that receives it. Okay. All right. Now either we're going to be walking around in heaven with these uh, white stones with our new name written on it, which uh, okay, so Jeff out there and, and David and, and Marilyn and and uh, Deborah and you know who I could go on down the list here, you know. But we meet in heaven, and uh, well, you got your white stone and I got my white stone and and uh, I got my new name written on mine, and you can't understand it, and I you have your your white stone with your no, new name written on it, and I I don't I can't understand it, uh, and so we're we're somewhat divided. I, I just, I'm telling you, I don't feel very comfortable with that idea. All right. Uh, I think it's much, we're looking at something much more dynamic than that. Now, for a fact, the meaning of the white stone continues to be a mystery to Bible scholars. But there's been several interpretations that have been offered, and so I'll offer mine. And I'm running out of time here, but in ancient Greece, the jury members would they'd cast a white stone to signify an acquittal. A black stone was the well, the defendant was 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 guilty. Sounds good, okay? Uh, we don't stand guilty before God, but the stones cast in the courts. Well, guess what? They didn't have names inscribed on. It was also used. The white stone was used as a, a an amulet or a charm, but that that custom there was associated with sorcery, so I doubt that, that that's the reference that God is using here. Buildings were uh, commonly made of white marble. Now, one problem with that is that the Greek word used in this verse means pebble, not stone. And though we are all members of the one temple Christ, that's another sermon in, all of many, in and of itself. A lot of Christians think that we are a bunch of temples running around. We're not. We're members of the one temple, Christ. The heavenly temple is comprised of believers who are the living stones of this temple. We know that from 1 Peter. The name on the white stone is your identity as part of this temple or body of Christ. Okay, we could possess it now. We know white denotes purity. Everybody knows that. Uh, the righteousness that we have in Christ, we have that now. What's interesting is the high priest's breastplate, which contained 12 stones, each one of them having the name of, of one of the 12 tribes engraved on it, which we know from Exodus chapter 28. And as the priest ministered in the, high, in the temple, the high priest ministered in the temple, he bore the names of God's people into God's presence. Okay? So in the same way, the white stone with the believer's name written on it could be a reference to our having access to God's presence. When? Someday or now? You decide. Uh, some will suggest the, it's a translucent, precious stone like a diamond. The word translated white is, is actually lukos, and it can also mean brilliant, bright, Okay, well, we know we have value. 
we shine in a dark place. Uh, diamonds are hard, so well we have strength. You know, and you can go on and on with that, but uh, perhaps that's true. Perhaps it's all of these things rolled into one. I don't know. I just don't see it as future. I see it as now. Okay. Some will have suggested that on this stone is written uh, the the name. Uh, it's uh, of Christ, not the name of the believer, not some believer's new name, but Christ. There are those who suggest that. Uh, Revelation does mention that the name of Christ is written on the foreheads of the saints. Okay. Uh, we are Christians now. Uh, there was the Roman custom of awarding white stones to the victors of athletic games, and that served as, as a ticket, somewhat, uh, so to speak, to a special awards banquet afterwards. Well, we know that that represents the kingdom age. You know, that's, well, but we could possess that now. Uh, your identity is, you could say, is defined in this life by what the Lord determines one's life is or, or how it's reflected, how, how God views you in, in a way that, that you don't know that now, but, you know, so, and, and so, and your identity here now doesn't depend on what others think of you, but on what God thinks of you. You can look at it that way. We know the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God even now, okay, uh, here's what interests me is these name changes that we see in the Bible occurred where, where Jesus changes a name, either the Father or Jesus changes a name, uh, the names of his people, uh, they occurred in their life then, okay? Not, they weren't, not later. There was no name change later in heaven. And I find that interesting. That's an argument for this being present. Uh, the having been written. Now here's interesting. The word having been written is a perfect tense. It was written in past time with the result that it remains forever written. Okay? All right. Well, now that doesn't really, I guess, argue for whether it's present or future. It could still be a perfect tense, but uh, but I'm I'm leaning I'm still I'm looking at all this and I'm I'm having a hard time believing that 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 this hidden manna and this white stone with a new name written on it is something that that we don't possess now but we'll possess later. I'm I'm thinking that it's quite possible that we possess these now. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm seeing in the text. And the receiving there in the text, the word receiving is a present active participle. We actively present tense receive it is what the text says. And I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. I've gone over time here. Uh, too long a video, I'm afraid. Stay safe out there. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for everything. I ask for your continued prayers for my healing and comfort. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.